welcome to the One Deeper Podcast. My guest on this episode is Dr. Barrent DeRoy. Barrent is part of the Department of Philosophy at Tilburg University School of Humanities and Digital Sciences. I know him as my instructor for, the, for a course on ethics of AI, and every lecture I've attended has been a winding path of discussion and discovery that I've thoroughly enjoyed. I look forward to many more conversations with Barron, but for now, this will have to do. So please enjoy this wide-ranging conversation with Dr. Barron DeRoy. Hey, so like basically, I'm just gonna <laughs> just gonna pick up where we left off in class, I guess. But uh, thank you so much for joining me. Like I know here, like I know I, I'm sure you have better things to do on a, on a Friday. But uh, I've actually been pretty like looking forward to this quite a bit. Like uh, when I so the idea of this podcast, I, w- I started it like about three weeks ago ish. But then you were sick, so you you were like one of the first people I asked to uh, to be a guest. But uh, you are unavailable, but thank you for joining me today. Though. Uh, thank you, Dash. I uh, really appreciate the invitation, and um, you'd be surprised uh, by what I do on a Friday uh, afternoon. <laughs> so, uh, I have plenty of time, and uh, I wish I were able to join uh, for yeah, one of the first few episodes. But uh, I'm really glad I'm here now. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so just to like get get folks acquainted, as I I realized after a couple of episodes that even though I know the people I'm talking to, people like. <laughs> when listen to they're like who <laughs> they have no idea so you want to just like just like uh give give us an intro or like what, about what you do yeah right of now? course yeah. of course of course for the people who don't know me uh, i imagine there's quite a lot of you uh, my name is barent de roy uh, i am a uh well a teacher in philosophy at tilburg university uh, that's how i know uh, dash he follows one of the courses i'm teaching and in my teaching and in my research i focus on uh, well ethics really uh, and mostly the ethics of technology and the ethics of business. Uh, so I'm trying to think about what moral and ethical philosophies can tell us about how we should go about using uh, technology and how we can go about doing business in a way that is is morally responsible. Right. All right. So, how, like, how did you um, how did you end up here? Like, like, like what, what did you want? Like, when you were in school, did you is it something you already knew in high school, or is it something just like you stumbled into later? Well, a uh, funny story is I, uh, I did actually go to high school here in Tilburg. Oh, okay. Uh, but uh, after high school, I, I studied many different things. And no, in, in high school, I, I didn't know what I wanted to do. Uh, I liked philosophy, but I also liked a lot of other things. And my teachers actually uh, cautioned against studying philosophy because they said, well, you know, what can you really do with that? Uh, so I listened to their advice and I studied liberal arts and sciences, which is a little bit broader. Yeah. Uh, and in the course of doing that, I figured out that, you know, like philosophy is just what what I love doing. I love thinking about these bigger questions in the background. Uh, so I pursued a master's in philosophy and eventually a doctorate in philosophy too. Uh, and in the course of doing that doctorate, I discovered that actually there's quite a lot you can do with uh, with philosophy. Uh, and I, I like taking that philosophy and applying it to yeah concrete areas that we uh, run into in our everyday lives, uh, such as business. That's like, it's actually quite, it's a bit of a, it's 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 weird, right? Like, if you think of the kind of people that you want in society, right? You would you would think that studying philosophy would be like a pretty like a it's pretty important thing to do. Like, why would like it's like why like isn't it isn't that kind of weird? Like that it's sort of um give like the in the situation we're in, it's it's perceived as something that's not as valuable as let's say, you know, and give up being a software engineer or like a doctor or something like, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I'm a little bit biased, but I think, uh, I think philosophy is very important. Uh, and that's why I also think it's, uh, it's important that we uh, teach philosophy to people who don't go up uh, and do philosophy for their careers. Like, uh, like myself, um, what we consider valuable is very subjective. And um, another thing, though, that I think is that you don't need to be a trained philosopher in order to do philosophy. Mm-hmm. Uh, Deshu told me that uh, these questions that we discuss in class, right, questions of justice, questions of ethics, what is a good life to live? Those are questions you've already been thinking out way before you ever stepped uh, into my classroom. Uh, so even though I think philosophy is important and everybody should 
sort of reflect on these bigger questions, uh, they can do that without, uh, you know, without studying philosophy as well. And of course, it's important that not everybody studies philosophy, I think, yeah, because we have a division of labor and uh, no, it's <laughs> all these other things are very important as well. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. I, like, I, I don't really understand. But like, it's, it's sort of like, I mean, if you like unwrap mathematics back all the way, it's like it's, you end up in philosophy, right? <laughs> it's, kind of, mm-hmm. it's, kind of, it's kind of weird. Um, but no, I was just thinking because, like you said, I've been thinking about this idea of uh, the good life, right? Like, actually, this is the first time I've heard of it. I, I mean, this is the first time that I've heard of uh, uh, um, that uh, formulation. Uh, mm-hmm. Like, I didn't know it was actually like a formal way of thinking, right? So, I actually yeah. made this interesting comment to uh, one of my friends the other day. It's like um, everyone has a way of behaving in the world, right? Even if you don't put conscious thought into how you behave. Like you have a you have a way of doing things how you react to certain situations right mm-hmm. and you, it might be the case that you, uh, like after a while you figure out oh wait this way of behaving has a name <laughs> you know like, right. like yeah. people study it like they they do this thing which is which is kind of weird um I, I know exactly what you mean and and actually that's a that's a pretty common um experience in philosophy as well uh, there there are philosophers who uh, they try to make sense, right, of things that go on in the world. They try to make sense of how we use our words, how we interact with each other, uh, the norms and values that govern society. Uh, and sometimes they discover, right, in the course of trying to articulate these concepts, that there is an experience that a lot of people have in common, uh, but that they've not given a name to yet. Mm-hmm. So then how can you talk about it, right, if you don't have these concepts? Uh, by the way, if you hear something in the background, I'm sorry, that's my uh, my dog. That's He's, totally uh, right. that's yeah. totally right. Oh. Louis, he's also a philosopher. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, what I wanted to say is one area where this has um, recently uh, been become very important is uh, is feminist philosophy. Mm. Uh, and feminist philosophers in the, the 60s uh, and 70s of the last uh, century, uh, they started talking to each other, you know, like sort of about their experiences as uh, as women. And then they found out there were a lot of sort of subtle injustices that they experienced uh, that were so normalized in society that they were not, they didn't have like a concept uh, to capture that injustice. Uh, For example, uh, sexual abuse within uh, within a marriage, there was no name for that at the time. It wasn't seen as sexual abuse. Uh, But then when these feminist philosophers started talking to each other, they they realized it was a very common experience, gave it a name, uh, and then by giving it a name, were able to talk about it and seek to uh, improve these uh, these conditions yeah this act of uh, th- like uh, this act of defining things right like that's that's that seems mm-hmm. like a very like a very human like a fundamentally human thing to do it's like okay well here are some things we notice we should probably give it a name so that we can actually like play around with it like it's like until we name something we can't sort of take it and then just like move the parts around and then once we have a uh-huh. name we can we can manipulate it and play with it and see what like see 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 what comes out of it Absolutely. I completely agree. Yeah. The same is true, uh, like with the concept of the good life, uh, like you said, right? Once we have a name for that phenomenon, we can ask questions about it, right? What does it consist in? Uh, What does it not consist in? How can we uh, achieve it? Right. Uh, And so on and so forth. So, okay. So this is, okay. This gets to like what I really want to talk to you about, right? This, this, uh, uh, okay. Like it wasn't, it, it was, it was, it hasn't been very long at all since I've started to think about, okay, I mean, what am I doing here and what should I move towards, right? So previously, um, in let's say in my early 20s or like uh, 18 to 20, 23-ish, right? I was mm-hmm. under the impression that like, it doesn't really matter what I'm doing here. It doesn't really matter. Like I am just a speck of dust floating in space like it's not really like it doesn't really matter what i do and even though there are strong arguments let's say you know from a purely deterministic point of view that that that, that, like that that might be the case right Mm -hmm. empirically even though it's n equals one it just would just didn't feel good like i mean not just not Mm -hmm. like did not just feel good but i was struck by this experience when I was able to sort of step back from my own involvement in my life and then look at it from yeah. from like a 50,000 foot point of view and then see that and then get this intuition like 
this is not good like what like this, <laughs> like you know yeah yeah, um, yeah. so uh, like i'm i'm curious about like the history of how how we've tried to tackle this like i'm like i'm sure you like, you've you've looked at this like, yeah so you're you're interested in my personal like, uh, history your personal history as well as like just in general like around like you know historically I mean, mm-hmm. there are so many different ways, right? We we try to tackle this. Like, what, like the the question of what we should value is basically yeah. like it's unbelievably complicated, right? Yeah, it's one of those topics, right? It's a big question in philosophy. Like you say, this has this is a question of of what is of ultimate value that has preoccupied philosophers since the dawn of time. Mm-hmm. Uh, the ancient mm-hmm. Greeks were debating this in their forums, uh, but it's a question that we continue to talk about today, both in philosophy and and outside philosophy, because Dash, I don't think. You're the only one who has that experience, you know, uh, coming out of their teens, early 20s, entering the world and trying to figure out, you know, what it all means uh, to them or what it is that they should uh, strive for. Uh, I've certainly uh, struggled with that question uh, as well. And uh, so my personal way of, of dealing with these kinds of questions of, you know, like, how should I live my life? What should I work uh, towards? Uh, I found a lot of comfort in, uh, and this won't surprise you, in in reading the the, the words of, of philosophers and other thinkers, authors who have struggled with that question way before I ever uh, set foot on this earth. Uh, and uh, by sort of placing myself in their shoes and seeing their concerns and their solutions, uh, I was sort of able to uh, try and articulate some provisional answers for myself as well. And anticipating maybe where this discussion is going to go, uh, One other thing that you said is, you know, like sometimes I got lost. I uh, adopted this point of view outside of myself looking down uh, and saw that um, in this big picture, it's very easy to get lost. That was a a very bad feeling for Mm -hmm. me personally. Uh, I think um, that's very recognizable. Um, but but what I try to do is that that, that big picture stuff right has a has a time and a place uh, in, in philosophical reflection or maybe when you're by yourself. Uh, but that when you're done with that, uh, usually people find it quite easy to just live their lives anyway and go about their daily yeah, business yeah, yeah. and absorb themselves sure. in daily projects, uh, going for a, a drink with their friends or having nice food, and then suddenly these big picture questions they uh, they don't seem that big anymore. <laughs> right, it's true. So like there is a like. Um... It's weird because uh, uh, my so the way I the way I, the way I, where I, this basically I'm, I'm basically turning this into a personal like a psychology like a <laughs> a personal <laughs> psychology slash uh, ethics review of of, <laughs> of 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 how I behave. But like okay, so, so <laughs> like my 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 main thinking about like how I should behave is that okay, so I've exposed myself to a bunch of like like to a historical account of a bunch of tragic and horrific things that happened to humanity across the world and you know in the, in the early 20th century before that you know like Cambodia uh, Mao's China Nazi Germany uh, Sri Lanka's own civil war with like its own atroc- atrocities and then all these things right so i was like okay mm-hmm. if i if i if i if i want to figure out where to go that's pretty hard but then I was like, okay, what about where I definitely don't want to go again? Like, yeah, can I figure that out at least, right? Mm-hmm. So I was like, okay, so I'm going to read about these things, okay? And then I realized, okay, yeah. I definitely don't want to go there, right? Um, and then I was actually, then I was struck by this idea that, um, you know, people tend to think that these terrible things just sort of happen. Like this one guy came into power and then it just did everything evil, right? But he was not doing this alone, right? Like hundreds and thousands of people, usually he or she or whoever it is, usually like participate or contribute in their small, tiny little way, right? So then mm-hmm. I was, so then one, so then I was like, okay, I was in Sri Lanka and it was, things were not, things were not like you know, not great, and I was like, okay, yeah. how? Like it's actually quite terrifying because if you sit down on your bed and ask yourself, how am I contributing to this? Mm-hmm. Like you'll find something. It's not something you want to find, but you'll find something. You'll be like, "Oh man, I should probably stop doing that. That's pretty stupid, right?" So, right, and, and then you're talking about how you are a part of yeah, exactly. a system that maybe you object to. Yeah, exactly. Something. Like so, like so, if I'm if I am constantly harping on about corruption, 
then I should take a take a second to think. Okay, like, what am I doing that's contributing even a little bit to this whole thing happening in this way, right? Absolutely. And yeah. uh, so my actual so every little so so, the, so so then I was like, okay, well, even though it feels like I'm very far removed from uh, having a big impact on these huge things there may be little things that I can do like to make sure it doesn't happen. Like, you know, don't like stop telling lies yeah. or like, you know, like stop like those little, those like little, little things. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But then, like you said, it can be quite paralyzing. Right. It's like every little, every little decision is like, Oh my God, like, is this, <laughs> am I doing the right thing here? So oh, yeah. given that you've been studying this for years, what's the, what do you do? Like, like, do you like, what is your approach? Dude. I see your struggle. I, I see your struggle. And I also, you know, you said uh, maybe we're uh, turning this podcast into sort of diagnosing my uh, moral <laughs> psychology, which we're all getting to know yeah. uh, Dash a lot better, uh, which I think is uh, is useful to all listeners. But also in the course of this discussion, I think we are drawing out some bigger themes, right? Yeah. And one of those recurring themes in what you've said so far is sort of this this struggle between the big picture stuff and uh, yeah, the, the, the daily uh, imperative mm -hmm. uh, of that each and every single one of us continue to live our lives. And um, what you said about these big uh, tragedies that happened in the past, sort of trying to learn from those, uh, I think that's a great strategy. I think that's a strategy that moral philosophers have used as well, right? They take these uh, terrible instances of when human behavior went wrong, and they try to sort of distill uh, the lessons from these for the future. Uh, George Santayana, he's a, he's a, a middle American philosopher. Uh, he said, those who uh, cannot remember the past or do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Right. Right. And I, I hear some of that despair in yeah. what you've said. Yeah. It's like, uh, why aren't we uh, learning these lessons? Mm -hmm. uh, systems keep functioning anyway. Right. And, and uh, whether we like it or not, a lot of us are implicated. Um, uh, I think the way to go about this is to keep having these discussions that we're having right now, keep reflecting on the lessons the past has to teach us, uh, and keep reflecting on what we can do in order to avoid uh, human tragedies in the future, even if we do not know what these lessons are, even if we can't articulate them. Uh, why do I think that's important? Well, history has also shown that moral values, uh, moral norms, they change all the time. Uh, so, so in order to prevent ourselves from becoming complacent and thinking that we're not doing anything wrong, uh, we should always try to, to, to sort of achieve a mutual understanding about where we want society to go. That act of reflection itself can be a useful guide because it forces you to think about the values that are at stake in your everyday decisions. Yeah, for sure. So I have something to add to that, if yeah. maybe in a minute, because you asked the second question as yeah, well, yeah, uh, which is how do you avoid being paralyzed mm -hmm. uh, by by this constant dialectic, right, between what these big picture questions in my everyday life? Um, I personally think, yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, if you've thought about these kinds of questions often enough, if you ask yourself these questions, uh, at some point, uh, they'll stop being paralyzing because at the end of the day, you still have to act, right? You still have to earn a living, you still have to feed your family. Uh, so ethics is important. Morality is important. But there's also these practical imperatives, imperatives that sort of force us to act. And I think very few of us are, in fact, paralyzed uh, at the end of the day uh, by these big questions. I have to say the exposure, like, fine, like, actually, like, learning that there's something as virtue ethics has made me has calmed me down considerably <laughs> because and it's gotten you down yeah yeah no 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 no. it's calmed me down considerably oh. yeah yeah because oh, you. because good. like because i was previously in a very rule-based um like uh like framework right like mm -hmm. here are the rules that you have to do here are the things you have to follow right and then yeah and then i was i was i was driving myself insane because some of these rules are like like how do I apply this rule here? Like it makes it, yeah. it makes no sense, right? So like, I see the value in that. Like yeah. I, I definitely see the value in that because I've noticed. I'll give you an example, right? For example, even so, even some doing something like this, this podcast, mm -hmm. right? Something that I enjoy doing. Like I enjoy talking to people. I enjoy this whole act of creating and then actually producing something, right? right. But it's not easy, right? It's difficult. Mm -hmm. And I found that, absolutely. and I found that even if it's even if it's something I absolutely love doing, if it's difficult, I'll just come up with a reason not to do it. Right. 
It's easy to rationalize, it's right? It's so easy to rationalize. It's so yeah. easy. Like, like I love all the content we're learning in class, right? Like when I'm in it, uh-huh. I, like I forget myself. Like I'm just like reading the stuff. Like every like, so I'm reading neuroscience or like the, the readings for our for our ethics class, and I'll stop every two sentences and like, man, I didn't think of that. Like that's crazy. <laughs> like you know, like so it's yeah. it's really nice. But then I have to set myself a target of a number of things to get done a week, a number of hours mm-hmm. to study. If I don't do that, and if I don't punish myself or like reward myself, or like if, right. I, yeah. if I don't have those rules, like for example, I have a simple rule. I have, I have to hit a set number of hours of studying at my desk a week, right? All right. No one's enforcing that. I'm doing, do, do, do that on my own, right? Yeah. So this is, con- this is it's weird. You have to have this, I, at least I do, this rule-based thing, but then sometimes- It works for you. Yeah. But sometimes the rules, like uh, trying to do that, drove me insane. Maybe I can I can jump in here. And so, for the listeners who do not know what what virtue ethics is, right? So, virtue ethics is a school of uh, of moral philosophy uh, that says, you know, like when we're pondering these questions of what it is the right thing to do, and what we should try and uh, answer them by looking at, you know, like what a good life consists in. We should strive to become sort of good persons. Uh, and what do good persons do? Uh, we'll look at the role models around us, right? People that we look up to, uh, people that we think are morally praiseworthy. These aren't persons who uh, steadfastly hold on to, uh, you know, like abstract, universal moral rules and laws. They're people who can improvise morally good behavior uh, in any given instance. So uh, they have sort of the wisdom in every situation to to quickly apprise uh, what's morally important and then to act on that. Uh, and I think that's speaking uh, to, to you, Dash. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm speaking for you now, but it no, speaks please. to me uh, because uh, exactly, right? So like confront, when we're confronted with these big questions uh, about what we should do, uh, virtue ethicists, they would encourage you to not get caught up, right, in, in these abstract universal ideals that you should aspire to, uh, but rather to ha- like have a look around you, uh, how you actually live your life and what you can do concretely to improve it which is a lot more manageable, right? We, we shouldn't have to become uh, perfect overnight. Uh, according to virtue ethics, doing the right thing, living a good life is something that you get better at with time and practice. Mm-hmm. And uh, just like you're finding out now with your, your study regimes, you're yeah. finding that rules are useful, but there's also a time and place when maybe you should discard them for a while, right? Perhaps when you get caught up in a really great philosophy paper or exactly. something. You're learning that improvising. Yeah, so like... Um, um... So it's like, what would, like, uh, what, like, what would, so let's say I want to be a scientist, right? So mm-hmm. one day would be, one thing is like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to study this many hours a, thing, a week, I'm going to read this many hours a week, hours of whatever. Or an alternative heuristic is, what would a good scientist do in this situation? Right? Mm-hmm. Like, what, yeah, would that, absolutely. What, what would that person do, given this uh, question he's been confronted with? Like, this is, and... So the que- okay, so the, the next question that brings is how how do you know what you should admire, right? That's a that's a great analogy, first of all, right? Because if you're a scientist and if you want to uh, develop uh, uh, whatever science you're engaged in, right? You want to you want to uh, perfect chemistry, for instance. If you want to be a good scientist, of course, you have to follow right the best chemical theories that we know that 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 are present to us, uh, available to us at this time. Uh, however, uh, there will probably come a time right, when you've mastered the field of chemistry, uh, when you need to abandon these theories, uh, because so far, historically, all of these scientific theories that we have, they've been proven wrong, right? Uh, they might be the best that we have at the time, but then somebody else comes along and improves on those existing theories. So there is a time and a place when we're learning to become a good chemist, when we should follow the theory, but there will also become a time and a place when we need to leave the theory behind and sort of improvise and come up with something new. Uh, and that's essentially what virtue ethicists argue is the case for ethics as well. We can follow moral rules, right? We teach our children moral rules all the time. Don't lie, don't steal. Uh, but there will come a time when a child has grown up and must learn to sort of sometimes leave these rules behind and, and improvise on a case by case basis. That's it. That's um, it. Sorry, sorry. Go ahead. You can say something. Yeah. No, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't think I answered your actual question. No, no, I just that's, no, that's totally fine. I, I, I just remembered some st- like co- a couple of conversations that I had with some people back home. Uh, this point about um, um, like transcending the rules at some point, right? Mm-hmm. That's 
I think that like I think that's a that's like a there's a deeply inbuilt uh, sort of like so the question here was that how do you figure out who you should emulate or like who right right yeah that was the question right but I mean I I, I could I mean don't quote me on this but um, there's fairly good neuro, neuro neurobiological and psychological evidence to suggest that we have this innate a sort of um, sense for these things like so mm-hmm. so w- one of the best pieces of advice that i ever got was like pay attention to the people you admire and the people you envy right because those are both indications about which about the direction that you that you want to move in yeah absolutely right. yeah so um and in in terms of transcending the rules i was reminded of a couple of things first of all like, like you've seen um the Dark Knight trilogy, I'm assuming. Mm-hmm. The, I have, yes, a uh, while ago, yes, right, but I okay, have. Okay. Like, okay, so <laughs> I'm a big uh, Christopher Nolan fan. Too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, even so, if you take the take, if you take the 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 if you take Batman, right? Um, he breaks all the rules, right? He's a vigilante. Mm-hmm. He's 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 hunted by the police. He's 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 essentially a criminal, right? Like from one from the rule based perspective, he's no different from the Joker. Right? Mm-hmm. He's a criminal. Yeah, he destroys yeah. things. Things blow up. He causes so much damage, right? But we have the sense that he is the hero in this story because he's not a slave to those rules. He's 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 transcended it to a point where he's trying to trying to move the rules beyond a certain point and try to like update it somehow. Right, and he does have a, a strong moral compass, right? right? Exactly. That, that leads him to break the rules in a very particular way yeah, to yeah. a very particular end. And a lot of these stories uh, have, like, especially superhero stories. I love, I love the, I love like thinking about superhero stories from in this perspective, right? Because, uh, like, all these stories, the the hero has first a stage of. Um, voluntary subjugation to a master right mm-hmm. where he right. where all he has is the rules like that's all he has yeah. he has to follow them precisely or that's it right but then uh-huh. but then the story is after a point he has to transcend those the student rules. becomes the master exactly those <laughs> those limitations right so it's 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 un, it's, it's endlessly fascinating so the idea of this virtue uh, the idea of virtue ethics to me was immediately like okay like this makes this this, this, feels this like is that. how I become Batman. <laughs> <laughs> this is how I become Batman. But, but you're, again, your your uh, parallel, the the parallel that you draw is on point. Uh, this is exactly how virtue ethics would believe virtue is cultivated, right? We uh, take a role model, we study uh, their behavior. Perhaps we learn uh, to, to sort of summarize their behavior and rules that we follow uncritically. Uh, as we grow up, as we become more familiar with these rules and how they're applied and uh, and why uh, these rules exist in this way, we can deviate from them or improve on them uh, when doing so is necessary. But this invites an important question, and it's a question that you've repeated twice now, which is, how do we know whose behavior to emulate? Sort of, How do we know uh, which role models are worth following uh, and which aren't? And that's an important question to ask ourselves because uh, as it turns out, Uh, A lot of people we have looked up to in the past have turned out later to uh, not be uh, that great persons at all. And I don't think I have to name uh, any names, but recently, for example, you know, the Me Too movement, we've seen a lot of famous actors, comedians, directors that we've looked up to for a long time as creative geniuses who sort of identify important moral problems in their work, who actually turn out to be pretty, uh, well, persons of questionable character. Okay, so actually... Like, not, not that you mentioned it, but this is an important question, right? So it's very important. Question, so, do you yeah. think? Do you think the fact? Okay, let's take this example, this concrete example. Oh, I, I think I know where this is going. Like, so do you know, no, no, I'm just asking. Like, do you? So, do you think that invalidates all the things that they did? Like, like I know, like it's like they did. Like, let's say, I mean, of course, they done terrible things, right? Mm. But does that invalidate? Like let's say okay, this is terrible. I'm I'm so sorry for my alma mater because I'm about to do this. But like, imagine if Neil Armstrong was <laughs> was someone who was like who came who was was found through so someone in the Me Too movement to be someone who has done something terrible, right? Right, right, right. Like I I feel 
gross just making the analogy because <laughs> yeah. for the record yeah. there is no indication whatsoever <laughs> no indication that Neil whatsoever. Armstrong is involved in any yeah. nefarious business this is simply an, an, an example right does that detract from him being the first man on the moon like I, how um, far do we take I, it that this is a a very a big question and actually this is a question that people uh, at Tilburg University are looking into uh, other philosophers so uh, if you're interested in this question i encourage you to check out the work of uh, alfred archer uh, he uh, he works in the department of philosophy he's published a, a book on exactly this question um, okay. it's a very well written book it's also not too long so i i highly recommend that nice. um i I don't think I figured out an answer to this question, right? Sometimes the work speaks for itself. Sometimes the the, the artistic merit achieved uh, speaks for itself and can be uh, enjoyed on its own. Sometimes it's very difficult to uh, uh, sort of view a work uh, independently of the person who created it. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, uh, you know, with some of the movies that Woody Allen has made, they're creatively very well made, but the themes that they discuss, right, an older man uh, hitting on, on younger women, uh, takes on a different tone now that we know uh, sort of what, what what he's been accused of. In his I don't life. even know what he's been what he's been accused of, but like like uh, well, exactly uh, like like uh, sort of abusing that kind of dynamic. Yeah, all I know is uh, Kevin Spacey. I want to <laughs> take this back uh, for for a second, right? Like uh, uh, because uh, one thing I will say, and I will say this is that uh, when we think about virtue ethics, right? Like like who should we model ourselves after? Uh, we should not model ourselves after uh, after people who uh, habitually or, or dispositionally uh, abuse uh, people they have power over, right? Like th that's just a very straightforward answer. Uh, we might still be able in some cases to uh, admire somebody's uh, creativity or uh, achievements in, in some sense, uh, but we will not be able, I think, to admire the, the character of that person in the way uh, that would make them the sort of person that we should. I think. I think. I think that's. I think that's an individual thing, right? Like, I think. Would you like? I didn't. I did not mean to put you on the spot, by the way. Like, <laughs> just, just, uh, that's a challenging question. Yeah. It's a great. It's an important question. I think many people are, are wondering the same thing and trying to figure that out for right, themselves. Right. For example, too. like like um, let, let's take Seneca for example, right? His mm -hmm. books are still read by people all over the world. I personally have found great, like, not just wisdom, like, not, like, sorry, not just a great yeah. read. When I, the, his, his work came to me at a time that was, that felt to me almost serendipitous. Like, it, yeah. was, it was like a book that was made for me. And it really changed my life around, you know, in a, in a real way, right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, he owned slaves. He did all like you know he lived he was a man of his time right so yeah what do you do with the situation like like do you burn all the books do you burn up burn all of his writings I think my answer to that I think I think it's an individual decision like for me as far as for me I, I come from the first I come from the point of view that clearly not all ideas are equally good right. Like once we have a set of goals that we want our society to move towards, the value hierarchy of ideas just form on their own, right? Because people like to think, oh, all ideas are equally good or all people are like, that's nonsense, right? That only makes, I mean, I'm saying that as if I know what I'm talking about. But anyway, uh, but my idea is that like what, we should have a marketplace of ideas and we should try our damnedest to make sure the, the terrible ones don't get to where they where they want to go, um, but I wouldn't say like let's burn all of Seneca's books because he owns slaves, right? I, yeah. I I find that to be problematic. No, I I, I see what you're saying, and also I see what you're saying about uh, people sort of me. It's important that people are able to make up their own minds. I I completely agree. So sometimes you know, like as a moral philosopher, as an ethicist. Uh, a, a danger that you should be wary of is that, is that you avoid moralizing, that you avoid telling other people what they should think or how they should act, right? right. Uh, because that negates an important moral value as well, which is sort of autonomy, right? The, 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 the capacity that everybody has to, to think for themselves and to try and answer these questions for themselves. And yeah, this is an important question now in the context of what you're saying as well. Um, uh, you mentioned Seneca, but uh, but Aristotle uh, is another philosopher, a very influential philosopher. Mm -hmm. He's the the founding figure in uh, well, at least the, the sort of the Western virtue tradition. Uh, he was also found to uh, like have some 
comments about slavery uh, and uh, the rights of women, for example, that don't age well. Yeah. Does that invalidate the rest of his philosophy? I, I don't think so. There's still a lot that we can learn from that. Yeah, like me uh, but I do, think, I do think it's important, though, to not uh, brush away uh, that context altogether. Uh, so now when people teach Aristotle, they often do remark on uh, the problematic aspects of his philosophy as well and how we've sort of abandoned that. Mm-hmm. And I think that might be potentially, but I, I, my thoughts on this aren't fully formed might potentially be a, a way to, to still well, teach and learn from these, these figures that uh, have a tainted uh, character. I mean, is that, I mean, that's, that's, that's the essence of being human, like original mm-hmm. sin. It's like, they, that's, we're all like, that's just who we, that's just, that's just, you can, you can, you can, you can unwrap that package all the way back, you know, and <laughs> we've made horrible, horrible mistakes. And we, but what may, what I, as, as far as I can tell, what makes us human is the ability to use, like, to consciously uh, get or get rid of the get rid of the stuff we don't need and keep the stuff that we can actually have valuable. And there's no way we can do that without having conversations like this, right? Like, there's no way. Yeah. There's absolutely no way, right? So, like, on, the, on that, we one hundred percent agree. The importance of dialogue, the importance of reflection. Uh, yeah. And I, I think partly, like, this dialogue, for example, is possible because you and I are kind of aiming towards the same thing right even though we're not like we haven't talked about explicitly we are both here like under we understand that this is a space of ideas that that we can we're here to like to do our best to talk to each other and then try to find a way to help each other clarify our own thoughts i mean that's my goal with this podcast for example that's my goal too in, in joining this podcast right. and in doing what I do in general. That's why I'm drawn to, to philosophy because philosophers are having these same kinds of exchanges, same kinds of discussions uh, in classroom too. Uh, th- this morning after our, our, our class, uh, I was invited to give a guest lecture for the study association at our university. And the guest lecture was actually aimed at the parents uh, of the students and other family members who, who tag along. Uh, so this morning I was able to talk about these topics with uh, a completely different audience from uh, the you know, the people that I usually engage with. And that dialogue with stakeholders all over society, I think that's one of the best things that we uh, we can do. And you don't need to, to go to university in order to do that. Right? You can also do it in the pub. You can also do it with your parents at home. You can do it anytime. Yeah, you know, like, it's funny you should say that because like my, my, my mom didn't even graduate. Like, she barely graduated high school uh, because like, you know, her, like because her, because her, uh, father passed away when she was really young, and like she had like a bunch of siblings that she had to take care of. But like mm-hmm. uh, some, but but uh, she's easily one of the smartest people I've ever met in my life. And uh, I've had some unbelievably like philosophical conversations with her. And I'm and I'm like, man, if you like like that's how did you even come come up with that? Because like just from like a practical sense of B, right? Um, mm-hmm. But uh, I, I, sorry, I digress. But um, so, <laughs> like, I wanted to ask you also. So let's say, so in the spirit of virtue ethics, where do religious figures stand? Because I find like, uh, like, isn't that kind of pretty similar? Like, if people try to emulate Jesus or the Buddha or uh, the mm-hmm. prophet, I mean, the prophet. I'm not sure. How, like, I don't know what I'm talking about. But like, I'm just curious as to how that overlaps. Yeah. No, a good question. And uh, by the way, I don't, I don't think you digress too much because, uh, of course, there's very there's different ways of achieving sort of a virtuous life. There are different ways of accumulating this wisdom, uh, and practical wisdom uh, is as important as the sort of intellectual wisdom that uh, perhaps you know philosophers have historically applied uh, aspired to. Um, uh, you asked about uh, the role of religion in virtue ethics, and I think that's a good question too, because often when uh, when I tell people I work in virtue ethics, they have an immediate uh, association of you know like virtuous conduct, virtuous morals. It sounds uh, like it's it's taken right from uh, sort of like Christian ideals of purity or uh, like aspiring to a, a higher good, and that is partly uh, partly reflects the history of virtue ethics, at least in in the West. It has for a long time been explicitly been bound up with with religious thinking. Uh, so this is maybe some useful uh, background, or maybe not. I don't know. If not, you can cut it out. Uh, Aristotle published his work in um, in ancient Greece. Uh, his work was forgotten for a long time, uh, especially after the collapse of, of 
Greek civilization and Roman civilization was forgotten about it for a long time. And then in the early, uh, well, in the Middle Ages, right, in the, right, right around like, uh, like 1000 uh, AD, uh, religious scholars, Christian scholars, uh, they rediscovered his work, uh, and they they had uh, they, they reestablished a sort of affinity with uh, with uh, you know the, the, the ancient Greeks, and they tried to make sense of Aristotle's philosophy in the context of the Christian religious uh, religion that they had uh, adopted. So one of the people who did that, for example, is Thomas Aquinas, uh, but people also did this uh, in the Middle East from a more Islamic uh, perspective. Uh, so then, around the year one thousand, we find all of a sudden a resurgence of virtue ethics, but it's been sort of co-opted and used in order to promote, uh, well, religious ends. And the influence of that tradition uh, has worked uh, its way throughout uh, the next few centuries after that. Uh, so there is a connection. And of course, these people, right, like Aquinas, they say there's a very particular character that we should strive towards, which is the character of well, well, a good Christian, or maybe the character of a saint, uh, or in, in Muslim philosophy. I, I, I don't know too much about that, but I also uh, I think it will be similar. Uh, so there is, there are strong historical connections, uh, and even contemporary philosophers who are drawn to virtue ethics, virtue ethics, they sometimes uh, argue of well, the virtuous life uh, is a, a religious life, a life in devotion to God. But there are also a great number of uh, philosophers who want their uh, moral philosophy to be more secular than that, uh, and who argue that in order to find out what the good life is, or what virtue consists in, or what sort of character we should develop. Uh, we need not be religious people. Uh, we can sort of um, define the good life or, or search for it independently of religious ideals. Uh, that's personally the version that I'm, I'm more drawn yeah, to. But, but you are right to note this connection. No, on, on that note, I will. I, I, I'm going to. I'll probably link and uh, the. Uh, I'm, um, you have you heard of? I mean, I'm sure you know. You know Sam Sam Harris, um, and you heard of Jordan Peterson. Oh yes, yeah. Uh, I uh, I'm not too familiar so with. So Sam uh, and Jordan Peterson had the series of debates about this idea, which you just mentioned, right? How to how to how to uh, create some sort of moral framework devoid of religion, right? Like how we, like and Sam Harris's position is that we can reason our way to a fundamental way of being, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think I, like I, I'll link that these the the debates to. Uh, on the podcast, maybe, and and, and like, and, and and I'll send it to you also. I think you'd be really interested in that. But but one question came up, and I know you don't you don't have much time left. But like, I wanted to ask you, um, the idea of telos, um, like mm -hmm. this, uh, the idea that we are as human beings, we're moving towards towards some some state, right? What do mm -hmm. you like? Do you have any thoughts on that? Because weirdly, I find that I don't know, like. Uh, no, I'll tell you what I think later, maybe. But like, what do you think about that? Well, so the, the notion of a telos, and telos is an end uh, that we naturally tend towards, uh, according to Aristotle. That's one of those concepts of Aristotle's philosophy uh, that for the most part has been uh, superseded. Uh, so Aristotle did believe that sort of as a kind of biological fact, each and every uh, one of us has a sort of a function that we naturally tend towards. And that function is... To, to, to become social animals. Uh, right now, I think a lot of people think that sort of biological essentialism, right, that human beings are something essentially, uh, they have an essential function that they ought to fulfill, uh, that, that strikes many philosophers as, as dubious. They, so, so they do not believe that we necessarily to, tend towards some end, uh, but they still believe that we can adopt ends for ourselves to strive towards. And maybe this is like uh, a... Side tangent, but like I'm just like telling you ideas that they pop mm -hmm. up in my head. So, like, would that work with from like a from like a panpsychist perspective? That like each individual, like we have a particular like a like everything. So, supposing that even everything is conscious, like a conscious state is a state of being, like a table or like a chair, mm -hmm. and everything has a role to play in some strange cosmic uh, drama. Uh, would that jive? <laughs> like you know, would that like does that work with like? Uh, uh like from from that perspective because um right so that's a good question the the view that everything is conscious I, that is a view that has been explored also by the by the ancient greeks uh and the the notion of teleology as aristotle uses it 
does apply to beings other than um, than human beings, right? Uh, Aristotle believed uh, that that pretty much everything in the natural world has a telos that it ends towards, right? The telos of a flower is to grow from a seed into a beautiful rose, for example. Uh, that, that has some natural structure, a natural end that the seed already tends towards. Um, but I don't think that Aristotle would uh, correlate or like identi- equate consciousness with having a telos. Uh, human beings, according to Aristotle, they have a very distinctive telos, a unique telos, uh, which involves, uh, well, well, you know, developing virtues, right? Like functioning well as human beings, uh, learning to be honest, learning to be wise, learning to be just, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, but yeah, so like you're connecting ideas that do have some connections, but they're not perfectly right. uh, identical, not perfectly related. That's that's like, so, okay, the reason I asked is because um, the idea of this telos was interesting to me because I have been toying with this idea that, so when I was first introduced to the simulation argument, that we are, we, we live in a simulation, right? And I was just thinking about the fact that, okay, well, like, so um, what if we're like everything we experience, everything that we are is just some program that's being run on a machine, right? Like, for example, Mm -hmm. uh, if you play a video game, right, you say, let's say you play a video game, you see all the characters and the colors and the the items and all the, and the engaging story and the narrative and the rewards and everything. You see the, the caught up. <laughs> you get super caught up in it, right? Like you get, you get sucked into it, but underneath it's just a bunch of matrix, man. Right. It's just about, it's, it's just, it's just a GPU and a CPU doing a bunch of math, like moving things from one cell in an array to another, like doing matrix transformations. Right. So I was thinking, I mean, why, why couldn't that, why can't that be us? Right, like why is it like maybe we are the result of some optimization function? Yeah, and yeah, the telos, yeah. the thing that we're moving towards, is something that's being optimized unbeknownst to us and on the on the substrate on which we are being mm-hmm. deployed. Right. I I think an important I think there's two important questions that we can ask. The first one is, um, how would we know? How would we be able to discover this? Uh, and the second question would be. If we found out that we were essentially in a simulation, uh, what would it matter? What practical difference would it make uh, uh, to our lives? And those are two two really really big questions. Yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, and these are also questions that, that that philosophers have asked. You may have heard of the the brain in the vat. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, a story which essentially asked the same question, right? Like if we were just a brain in a vat hooked up to a machine that made us think we're living this life, mm-hmm. uh, how would we be able to know? Uh, and uh, would it make our life any less valuable? I think, I th- the same experiences. I think there is value to it. I think, I think, I think it would be valuable to know because, because I'm struck by the strangeness of this experience. Like mm-hmm. this whole thing is really weird to me. Like there's, <laughs> there's a there's a weirdness that I can't really put my finger on, but like it's just weird. Like, Dash, are you high? <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> definitely. Like, no, not to my knowledge. But uh, <laughs> but this is something that's been that's been uh, that's been uh, with me for a while now, and I was yeah. just um, and. Um, um, for, so, for example, like I used to play a lot of video games, like uh-huh. like a crippling amount of video games, right? That's all. Like that's <laughs> that's why you needed to come up with a study regime, exactly, set apart exactly because exactly. I am because I, I I have the exact wrong combination of video games. Like I love like technology and like I like I love stories, I love fiction, and I'm competitive as hell. So uh-huh. like yeah, it's just a it's just a mess, right? <laughs> Everything's yeah. bad. So so I was so. Once I started thinking about it, I was like, I actually thought, started thinking, why do I find these games so motivating? Why is it that I, when I start playing video games, that's all I want to do is play those video games, right? Yeah. Um, and it's because they tick cognitive and neurobiological boxes that yeah. exist for to be yeah. used somewhere else, right? 
Yeah, I mean, absolutely right. right? You, they give you feedback, immediate gratification mm -hmm. if you achieve an objective. Uh, like you said, you're competitive, right? You compete against others, and yeah. you know, like you want to do better. You want to top the scoreboards. Yeah. yeah. So the way that the, the the games work because they, I mean, they're not they're not putting anything. They're not like changing a new circuitry. They're just leveraging circuits that are already there, leveraging tools that are already there. So I was like, okay, well, what's so different about the video game and my life, right? In this video game, I wander around, I work, like I, I grind to collect gold and then I go and get things that I want, right? And then I get experience points, which I spend on my talents, right? So I was like, why don't you just do that in real life? Like, so I, so I just sat down, I was like, okay, okay, what skills do I want to have? What talents do I want to do? And then I just like, okay, I'm going to go grind at that instead. And then, like, <laughs> you know, so like, yeah. there's this, like this, the similarity is... It's uncanny, don't you think? Like, it's weird. It's, it's weirdly yeah. similar. Well, could, you could tie this back to the simulation, right? So yeah, if what, we're in a simulation... That's what I'm saying. That's, what I'm, that's exactly yeah. what I'm saying, right? Like, Hey, I wanted to, like, ask you one question, uh, which uh, perhaps is a bit of a tangent, but it's related to what you, uh, what you just said. Have you heard of, of gamification? I have heard of gamification, yeah. Right, so so you're right, right? There are these neuro yes. uh, biochemical processes that, uh, like, that games sort of like they touch, they take the right boxes. There are also people who are trying to sort of tick these same boxes outside of the context of a game mm -hmm. in order to, well, get them to grind, right, <laughs> and, yeah. uh, and achieve real world objectives. Like like if you're wearing a Fitbit, uh, yeah. it tracks the number of steps that you take, the, the numbers of calories that you burned, and you get direct feedback, right? You get a score, and mm -hmm. you can uh, see if you hit your daily target. If you hit a new record, you yeah. can compare that scores with others. So this is a way in which these software designers have, have tried to sort of co-op yeah. that mechanism as well. Exactly. And then when I learned that the best reward is for the for the for the interaction itself to be rewarding, that was like a Z moment for me. I was like, oh wait a minute. So like the best reward is to do something that is in and of itself rewarding without any external uh, yeah. like the experience itself is the reward not the yeah. end goal so i was like okay well that's how do you find that out right all right this is excellent dash because now we've come full circle we're back to virtue ethics <laughs> uh, according to virtue ethics if you've uh if you've developed this moral character that we should aspire to uh then doing the right thing will sort of become uh something that we consider worthwhile sort of intrinsically yeah. valuable to us right. so, that, so that's, so a, that's great a great way. that's a great way to bring it back and like i know you have to yeah, go yeah. but i want to ask, ask one last question i asked everyone of who's, course who's been on, of course on here so well it's two-part question one part is like what kind of future or like a world do you think it's worth running like hell towards like really running towards as a society as, a, as an individual versus a world that's something we should run away from. So like a hell to run away from and a heaven to run towards. Like, do you have any, um, <laughs> any idea, any, 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 anything that you think is, fits the criteria? Well, that's a big question. I, 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 these, this is a question I'm still trying to, uh, to, to wrap my head around. I, I try to sort of like uh, take today's world, right. And then see what I like and what I don't like about today's world. Uh, but but I'll try and extrapolate from that a little bit. So what one thing I am worried about is uh, the the amount of power that is currently concentrated in the hands of a, a well, very few powerful corporation corporations and and businesses, and that power is being exerted to influence politics globally. And I do think that it is also this is something this is a disparity that will probably grow worse if uh if nothing happens so my the, the dystopia that i'm scared of is uh a world in which uh our, our impact on local politics is greatly diminished and a world in which powerful corporations uh, have a lot of power over our individual lives because i think once that happens it might be very difficult to um do something about it man i should, I should have started uh, so, with, so I, I should have started with this comment, this question because we could we could talk about that for another like three hours that's that's amazing. maybe you can invite me back on a podcast yeah, yeah, uh, a, couple, sure. a, couple of, uh, <laughs> a couple of people down for the sure. line uh, so a utopia that i i think uh, like is worth striving towards is a society in which people have their individual freedoms right? they can do the research they can do the business that they like and not against all business uh, but in which there are effective checks and balances effective ways of of um 
regulating uh, big companies, uh, effective ways of participating in political debates uh, in, a meaningful, in a meaningful way. Right? Yeah, so today we are able to participate in political debates. It's very polarized. I think it's important that we do find some sort of common ground in order to uh, uh, answer these questions. Yeah, this idea of political participation is something I've been thinking about a lot. And like, especially it came up today in class in terms of the... Uh, yeah. In terms of thinking about it from the uh, what's it what, what, what was the uh, the thought experiment the uh, uh, veil of the ignorance, of ignorance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when we discussed John Rawls yeah, yeah 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 but like you know like like it struck me that like democracy needs like we need like some updates you know like <laughs> like why is it like like why can't we like we have the technology like why can't we have more micro control over our decisions right we make one decision every four years and it's like what you know like yeah it's kind of it's, i don't know i think we have a technology but we just need to like like move it like try, try to integrate it somehow but you know that's a great question right like how can these new technologies how can they help us make some of these ideals of justice of fairness of, of morality um, how can they facilitate uh, these ideals that's that's maybe something that we can discuss another time but i, I do think that's a very important question to ask yeah absolutely. Uh, yeah well, and the act of asking it is already making progress towards it definitely <laughs> Like, this has been great. Like, I could talk to you forever, man. <laughs> but uh, thank you. I'm so sure we'll talk to each yeah, other. Definitely uh, talk, to you, talk mm-hmm. to you again. Um, um, thank you for giving me this time and indulging me in my uh, nonsense. It's I really appreciate my it. My pleasure. It wasn't nonsense. <laughs> oh, great. Because, like, I genuinely, like, it was, it was great. And uh, so thank you so much. And um, I hope you have a great weekend. And then I'll see you in class, I guess. See you next week. Uh, uh, yeah. And uh, you have a great weekend as well. All right, thanks. I'll see you. See ya. Bye. Thank you for joining me in this conversation. I hope you got something out of it. And until next time.